So welcome back everybody to the second Q&A session. This time I will cover roughly the first 80-90 minutes of wireless transmission. Just to repeat the major issues there, wireless transmission that might be a bit strange for computer scientists because uh, usually you have to deal with ones and zeros and bits uh, so not that much with these strange things that happen uh, in the wireless domain. It's quite often interesting and uh, surprising to see for computer scientists that, oh, wireless transmission, okay, electromagnetic waves, that's something like uh, light, x-rays, whatever, but we use way, way lower frequencies. So usually we operate in the range of, let's say, uh, something like here, 300 something up to uh, megahertz, up to 60 gigahertz, something like that. So you can easily use wireless communication as well uh, here in these very high frequencies, light or visible light, uh, then this is called VLC, visible light communications quite interesting for example because you all have a camera built into your mobile phone and so in the supermarket you can directly transmit a lot of data by simply modulating the LED light so the the lighting of the supermarket can be used to transmit data to your mobile phone but that requires that you hold your mobile phone for example in your hand so then the camera looks up into the light so that's one way of doing it. And you can also easily transfer data maybe to these um, little price tags you see at the goods. So you can reprogram them over the air using the lighting of the supermarket. So just side remark. So here it, uh, it's important for you to understand the basic issues of uh, this wireless communication. And um, besides many different frequencies and all these things, you should always keep one thing in mind before we come to the Q&A and you can as always ask whatever you want to ask is uh, this slide. This slide uh, that tells you basically one thing. There is no ideal transmission system in real life. So uh, I did not write any number here, something like uh, whatever, uh, 30 megahertz or what, whatever. That doesn't matter. So all technical systems, if you want to transmit any data over the air, well, over the air through space, they have certain limitations. So what you can never transmit is this, what we call direct current, so zero hertz. So direct current does not work. Also very low frequencies, they do not work. That's the same for the old telephone system. So very, very low frequencies or your hi-fi equipment, for example, at home. So you cannot transmit something like one hertz or something as, in, as audio signal. So you always have a certain, uh, let's say, cutoff frequency. This is not a sharp, sharp frequency, but there's a certain threshold and you can say, okay, the attenuation is too high here, so we cannot use the signal. And the same is true for very high frequencies. So this is why I make these sometimes maybe strange examples. Uh, use a flashlight and try to shine it through a copper wire. Hmm, doesn't work. Uh, because, well, copper wires cannot transmit light. But light is an electromagnetic wave. Copper wires can easily transmit several megahertz. That's your DSL cable at home. And the same is true for the wireless domain because we have real antennas, we have real amplifiers, so called power amplifiers at the senders and low noise amplifiers at the receivers. And they all have these characteristics. So there's a certain bandwidth you can use. So for example, in your mobile phone, you have four, five, six different antenna types because you operate on different frequencies. Uh, so also the antennas, only the antenna characteristic already limits the bandwidth we can use. 
And important for us is then exactly this bandwidth. So if we have, for example, 30 megahertz available here, uh, that means we can play with these 30 megahertz and try to squeeze in our bits we want to transmit into these 30 megahertz. How we do it, that's part of the next lecture. Uh, so please have a look into this modulation and all these things. Here, it's important for you to know, okay, the bandwidth, that's the important part. And one thing that's always difficult for students to understand, I hope you will understand it way better after the next lecture, these 30 megahertz, we do not care where they actually are. So for example, if the lower limit is one gigahertz and then the upper limit is then this one gigahertz plus 30 megahertz we still have only these 30 megahertz so if we say the lower limit is 10 megahertz and then the upper limit is 10 plus 30 40 megahertz in the end, we have 30 megahertz of bandwidth and only this bandwidth determines how many bits per second we can transmit. So um, if you look up Shannon, Wikipedia or the lecture uh, telematics computer networks, you will find exactly this bandwidth in the Shannon formula because it says the bandwidth and then times, okay, logarithm one plus signal to noise ratio. That is the Shannon limit. So that's the upper limit of bits per second we can transmit under certain circumstances, signal, noise. That's electrical engineering details. But here for us, it's important, the bandwidth. There's a certain bandwidth uh, we can use so quite often uh, students make the mistake that they think, okay, uh, 30 megahertz, oh, but we are operating at one gigahertz. So we can transmit way more compared to if we have 30 megahertz at 400 megahertz. No, it depends on the bandwidth we can use because that's exactly now where we'll squeeze in our bits with the help of the so-called modulation topic of the next lecture. That's just something I want to emphasize here a bit more before we come to the uh, Q&A. Then also uh, something, have a look at these different ways of uh, displaying something. So if we, let's say, um, want to display signals or uh, um, amplitudes, etc. So display, uh, we want to show this, here we are back. Um, then quite often we use something that is called the constellation diagram. Constellation diagram, that's on the right hand side. Um, this is something that might look a bit unfamiliar in the beginning that we say, okay, what is this? We trans transmit something and there's an angle and there's an amplitude, but that's nothing but the phase shift. So if we assume a nice sine wave and then as shown on the left hand side, we shift it. We shift it a bit and you learned in math uh, that the circle is 360 degrees or 2 pi. And if we shift, for example, by 90 degrees, then we have pi half so that's the phase shift and this is the typical way of how we actually uh, you know show the quadrature amplitude modulation things we will have in the next lecture it's just have a look at this and uh, if we you then look at the modulation schemes then you will understand again this way of displaying our signals so the left hand side is the usual thing we have from oscilloscope. Then I went a bit through uh, different types of antennas, antenna patterns, and the most interesting scheme before we come to the questions in the end is uh, the MIMO idea. 
So MIMO, just to repeat this, MIMO means you have multiple input, multiple output. So we use several antennas. In the ideal case, several antennas at the receiver side and at the sender side. And we can do many fancy things doing this. So uh, with the help of MIMO, uh, we can, for example, pick the best signal out of the space so we can check which antenna has the strongest signal, for example. Or as I explained on the slides, uh, if we delay the signals we receive via the different antennas, we can also add the different signals. So we can reconstruct a much stronger signal. That's the idea of this MIMO thing. And if we just turn it around, so let's say uh, we send with the help of several antennas that's shown here on this slide. Um, and then if we do some time delay by sending the different signals, we can do something that is called beam forming. Why beam forming? It's a quite important uh, idea. Depending on the delays, we can create a maximum at a certain point in space. So basically we can follow a single receiver. That is the, that is the idea here. And if you're just outside this maximum, for example, here, this second receiver, well, you might get a signal, but maybe it's simply too weak. So it's rather noise. And only exactly in this point in space, the maximum is strong enough that you can then reconstruct your original data. That is one of the key ideas. Okay, so that was just uh, to wrap up a bit about this very first section. And as this is a Q&A session, I should not talk all the time, but we should come to questions and especially to your questions. Okay. As always, tasks, so please do have a look at this. This is just uh, either frustrating or interesting to see how those organizations work. Okay, because for some of the organizations, it's very difficult to find out where are the documents, how can I find it, and who is responsible. For others, it's very simple. Okay, now back to the questions. The first question, hmm, why can waves with a very low frequency follow the Earth's surface? Does anyone have an idea? That's nothing I have really explained in the video, but maybe someone has looked this up. And why can't we use them for data transmission in computer networks? Well, we can use, but... Hmm. The second part, at least, should be or could be obvious. Yeah, exactly. So one of the answers because they are longer than high waves. Yeah, so the wavelength is longer. And if you have this low frequency, long waves, those waves are called surface waves. And the higher frequencies, so if you have higher frequencies, you have reflections at the ionosphere and then the waves basically bounce back to Earth, especially at night. But for lower frequencies, the waves follow the Earth's surface because the surface is conductive and then you have a so-called wave guide between, let's say, the ionosphere and the Earth's surface and the waves they follow around the globe. That means you can reach, for example, ships since many, many years, ships with these very low frequencies and those waves, they follow the Earth's surface. And by the way, the Earth is not flat. It's a sphere. So, okay, just <laughs> don't get me wrong. So those waves, they follow uh, the surface. And not using for data transmission, 
Well, think of Shannon. Think of Shannon. We have a, this bandwidth and the bandwidth is quite important for the data rate. And if you have very low frequencies, let's say you operate at 10 kilohertz, how do you want to squeeze in? Our example was 30 megahertz. So this simply does not work. So uh, with these low frequencies, you cannot uh, modulate a higher bandwidth on these low frequencies. So the bandwidth B, that's the important part in the Shen formula and at low frequencies, it simply does not work. So the question was, uh, do the waves get magnetically attracted? It's a conductive surface. So it's basically the earth surface is a conductor. Um, so it has nothing to do with the magnetic field of the, the earth itself, but it's like a conductor. It's like if you know a coax cable, a coax cable with a core and then this copper around the copper shielding around the core then the waves can also travel between the shielding and the core. So you have a waveguide or you can also use a metal pipe for microwaves, for example. And um, I think Wikipedia has a nice explanation uh, how those so-called surface waves, how they work. So they are acoustic, but they're also electromagnetic surface waves again without going into all these electrical engineering details. Okay, so the second question was just for basic understanding. Why do we only regulate, let's say, lower frequencies? What does lower mean? Um, well, up to some hundred gigahertz. Why not higher frequencies? Terahertz range. Why don't we regulate this somehow? Any ideas? So what does it mean if we go to higher and higher frequencies? The higher we are, yeah, sunlight, that's, that's a quite a good idea. The higher we are, so some terahertz and then going up to 300, 400 terahertz, we are actually in the range of light, visible light, um, something like this, infrared light, uh, ultraviolet. Okay, then x-rays, we have regulations there, but not from the ITU-R. The problem for really high frequencies are then like x-rays are completely different. That's cancer, for example, they can cause skin cancer, uh, uh, the ultraviolet light, you all know this. Uh, but for the lower frequencies, it has to be regulated by the ITUR because of interference. The problem for the lower frequencies, they can travel quite a long distance. So if I operate a radio station here in Berlin at a certain frequency, uh, and the same frequency is used in Stuttgart, for example, there could be interference. And so we have to regulate this. If we operate something at the frequencies of light, well, it's very easy to shield these electromagnetic waves. Just use a piece of paper or metal or, or, or concrete wall. So light will not shine through the concrete wall. So the higher the frequencies are, the shorter are the distances you can actually travel with these uh, with these electromagnetic waves at a certain output power of the antenna. Yes, I know the sun, <laughs> that's, a, that's an example for high frequencies, visible light and uh, ultraviolet light and long, long distance. But remember, there's nothing between the sun and earth. If you do the same here um, on um, here on earth, you have trees and buildings and uh, clouds and many, many obstacles. So even if you use a laser beam and you have a straight line, you have a problem, especially for longer distances. What do you do straight line from Berlin to Stuttgart? Doesn't work. 
doesn't work because there's a horizon in between. You cannot have a straight line. You, you, I mean, you have actually the Earth is a sphere and the light will not follow the, the sphere. Lower frequencies, for example, GSM, uh, you can easily have something like 30, 40, 50 kilometers on the countryside. But you have the, the experience with wireless lands, maybe at home. Uh, I get you quite often got angry about your wireless LAN that it does not operate uh, in certain rooms or in certain corners. Yes, because wireless LANs operate at 2.4 or 5 gigahertz and then we have a problem already with a single wall, especially at 5 gigahertz. Maybe you noticed at 2.4 gigahertz you will receive many more networks from your neighbors compared to 5 gigahertz because the attenuation of walls, etc., is way higher at higher frequencies. So that's that's the idea. So this is why we don't have to regulate the high frequencies by ITUR. These are different authorities regulating this, so X-rays, etc. Okay. So then a bit more about standardization, just that you understand the approaches. Uh, if you listen uh, to the videos, you learned a bit about how Europe is doing this and how the US is doing this. Does anyone have an idea what the consequences are of the different ways? I can also explain them again, but maybe already someone has an idea. Maybe someone really watched the videos. Ah, big silence. Okay, so the basic difference is that traditionally in Europe, the governments, authorities regulate. Yes, yes, yes. And there was one answer that's fully correct. Fully correct. Yes, in the US, technologies have to fight for the frequencies. That's right. And uh, in Europe, we don't have a, let's say, a free market. You are absolutely right. Um, so the traditional approach in Europe is governments organize it. And the governments then do these auctions. Auctions will come back when I talk about third generation systems. There are so-called beauty contests or uh, real auctions. And the different operators, they compete for the frequencies. And then they pay something to the government. And uh, then the government gives them the licenses for certain frequencies for some time. And the US the approach is that the government says, okay, we have certain frequency bands and we regulate, for example, the maximum output power to limit a bit the interference and then let the market decide and the result is that in the US and other markets you have several different technologies at the same frequencies that's also what the table shows you uh, for the US for example at 1900 megahertz in Europe traditionally you have only one technology on one frequency so there are pros and cons for this. So the advantage of the European approach is uh, that if you have only one technology there, usually you have less interference. You have less interference and because you know exactly this technology knows how to do the medium access. We will come to medium access uh, uh, chapter three. Um, the disadvantage is that you have to decide for a certain technology many years before you actually deploy it. Okay, you can make this a bit shorter, but still uh, you cannot simply come up with a new technology at the same frequency. So first we have to phase out the old technology, then we can install the new technology. This is what currently happens. More and more we give frequencies back that were used for GSM and we reuse them, for example, for LTE. 
Although in the end, uh, my guess is we will first stop using UMTS, the third generation, before we stop the second generation. The technical reason is that we have many devices like vending machines, uh, street signs, etc., that need the GSM network to work. So maybe we need GSM a bit longer. Uh, but then we give back the licenses and the government already decided together with the companies uh, that um, we use these frequencies then for example for LTE for the operator T-Mobile or Vodafone or Telefonica in Germany. So in Germany it's the Bundesnetzagentur. So that's the classical European approach and the advantage in the US is that the better technology in the end or the technology with more customer uh, will win but you might have more interference so the quality of the network is sometimes lower and really depending where you are in the US you will have real big differences in your let's say experience of the network quality so uh, coverage is a different issue. What does coverage mean? Coverage with what kind of bandwidth, etc. But so there are pros and cons for both sides. Okay, and please just do ask if you have questions, just uh, write them in the chat. Oh, very good question. Would a technology that has a more aggressive medium access win? Yes, absolutely. So, to give you a um, real life example, in the early days of Bluetooth, Bluetooth uses the same frequency as the wireless LAN, classical Bluetooth, classical wireless LAN, they both operate at 2.4 gigahertz. Wireless LAN is, well, rather a shy protocol. I will explain this in some more detail in a later chapter and wireless LAN first listens into the medium. If someone else uses the medium, uh, then wireless LAN says, okay, I step back, I wait until the medium is idle. Bluetooth doesn't care. Bluetooth simply uses the medium. It jumps around through many frequencies, 79 channels, it jumps around and it does not care if anyone else uses the medium. So indeed, it can happen that Bluetooth kills the wireless LAN. And this is why we today have special mechanisms. I will explain them as well, that Bluetooth and wireless LAN can cooperate. So indeed, and that's the point why, for example, the US, you have to regulate the maximum output power. Depending on the medium access, you can kill another scheme. But um, as this is used, for example, at the 1900 megahertz, we have medium access schemes uh, that do not really kill each other, but they, well, they are not really harmonized, but they can somehow cooperate. But indeed, there might be interference. So if you're close at a, let's say, host trial um, base station, so base station from other operator with a different technology, there might be interference. And indeed, if you switch off this very friendly medium access scheme of a wireless LAN, you're always the winner. So you can simply wipe out all the other participants in a wireless LAN. And this is also a reason why normally you do not have access to the medium access control of your wireless LAN. Yes, I know there are controllers where you can access them, so you can switch this off. And uh, this is, by the way, one of the projects not to uh, well to kill the other wireless LAN participants, but in one of the projects we offer, we used uh, so-called software-defined radio. And with this software-defined radio, we can basically do whatever we want. And indeed, if you are a bit hostile at 2.4 gigahertz, the wireless LAN breaks down. The same could be done with any cellular network, but then it's like stealing. It's simply not allowed. But you're fully right. With a more aggressive uh, medium access, 
uh, you will be always the winner. Yeah, it's unfair, but it's feasible. Okay, so ISM bands. ISM, why are they so important? Especially in the national availability. So ISM, and I see there's always a delay in the answers. Just to answer the last question, uh, jamming, uh, you're absolutely right. Jamming is simple. Uh, it's a simple approach for those who are not familiar with jamming. Jamming means simply, well, just send some noise on a certain frequency. Uh, so this is an attack on layer one. On the physical layer, this can always be done. Jammers are, for example, used if you have uh, whatever president of a certain country visiting, uh, then the authorities use jammers so that no one can interfere with their radio systems. And their radio systems, they survive uh, the jamming attacks. Or uh, so, well, that you can avoid that bombs go off, for example. Uh, remote controlled bombs, things like this. So jamming, jamming always works, uh, but that's a layer one attack. We can act a bit more clever, so we can directly attack the medium access control, then that's a layer two attack. But in the end, yes, you cannot use the network. The problem with jamming is, if you're the bad guy, uh, you can detect jamming. The advantage, so to say, for the bad guy for this attack on layer two is, if you do this in a very clever way, so as soon as mediums idle, then you blast some data into the air, it's more difficult to find you. Jamming, uh, you can do something that's called triangulation and the authorities will find you. So usually uh, the typical frequencies, they're monitored all the time, all over the country. And if there are some interference, uh, you can be triangulated and with the help of three antennas, you can see where the source of the interference is and the authorities may find you. So don't do this. <laughs> it's also written in all the devices, so do not send on these frequencies. Yes, you can, but you should not do it. Okay, ISM bands, right answer. Um, the point is for these classical PCs, tablets, etc. You don't want to have a license. You don't want to have a contract with a certain network operator, for example. And with the ISM bands, you can simply operate your device and that's it. So you don't have to have a contract with a Vodafone, Telefonica, T-Mobile before you switch on your wireless LAN. These are so-called license-free bands. That's at 2.4 gigahertz or license exempt bands that's at five gigahertz. So these are frequencies where you can simply operate your device. At 2.4 gigahertz, you will find the microwave ovens, uh, electric welding, heating systems, etc. At five gigahertz, it's a bit different in Germany. These are so-called license exempt bands. And if you have a DSL router with a wireless LAN, have a closer look at five gigahertz, it might display, I will skip these frequencies because of flight radar. At five gigahertz, we sometimes have uh, flight radar that's used for aircraft control. And then our routers have to skip these frequencies. So license exempt, I will come back to this when I talk about wireless LANs, but license exempt at five gigahertz, that means you have to step back using these frequencies as soon as your wireless LAN adapter recognizes, oh, there's radar. There's radar going on on these frequencies. So yes, you can also switch off this, etc. But then again, this is not allowed. So we need special mechanisms at five gigahertz uh, compared to 2.4. And also for 2.4, you will find uh, you can use, for example, in Europe, more channels, so-called channels. There's channel 12 and 13 at 2.4 gigahertz. We can operate our devices not in the US. 
So uh, there are some differences also compared to Japan, but the majority of the channels, they can be used uh, in more or less all countries. So there are some minor uh, differences, uh, especially just maybe if you have certain uh, TV adapters operating at 5 gigahertz, sometimes they can only use the lower frequencies, lower channels of 5 gigahertz. So you have to take care of this because maybe your wireless LAN simply jumps around in the 5 gigahertz and then suddenly it doesn't work. Hmm. Okay. So the question was, and that's a good question about 5 gigahertz and radars, is this something like cognitive radio? Yes, in the end. It was not called this uh, when they first came up with the 5 gigahertz, but indeed uh, the routers, they check the frequencies and if they detect radar, they will block the frequencies and they will display this. If you, for example, look up in your router and see how the frequencies are used, where your neighbors are, then you will find, aha, uh -huh, that's our, for example, dot 11A network, AC network. And then uh, they have something that is called dynamic frequency selection and, and dynamic power control. So uh, those wireless LAN hotspots, they have to control their output power to avoid interference with flight, flight radar. That's a, uh, that's a problem. So, and this is kind of a cognitive radio. Cognitive radio is something uh, where you actually scan uh, the air and then um, you step back if you find another user that has a certain license on these frequencies. I will come back to this on slide 26, but that's for the next Q&A session. But you're right, that's something like this. Okay, so and then just again a question just for your better understanding. Is it possible to transmit a real digital signal? Can you do this? And can you do this especially without any loss? And why? Yes, so the right question is this is not possible. And um, so the ideal signal is even not possible inside your computer. So even inside your computer, it more looks uh, this kind of rectangular, rectangular, nice ways. They do not exist. So in real systems, because you have capacitors, they look more like this. Though they swing always a bit over and so it more looks like this. Because also in real computers, you do not have arbitrary high frequencies. So nature doesn't like these corners here <laughs> so and so we have a bandwidth limit and that's it so and this is why we have this kind of distorted signals and without loss we cannot transmit anything so without loss uh, there's always some loss on the analog part the only thing is what we can do is we can reconstruct the original data based on whatever we will receive okay so that's the classical thing. So, and this is also why we have maximum limits of bits per uh, second. And what we always try to maximize is basically bit per second per Hertz. So how many bits per second can we squeeze through a certain part of the spectrum? And then basically this also per cubic meter because uh, we can do this beam forming thing and then uh, it's in the end a question how many customers can you have in a certain part of a city of a building etc uh, how much of the spectrum do you need and what is the maximum data rate you can achieve so that's always something we want to optimize but this depends on modulation schemes next lecture and how we then actually encode our bits, how much forward error correction and things like this we need. And then there was a final question about directional antennas. So can we use them for mobile phones? Yes, no. 
um, we can, how can we improve antenna gain? <laughs> Good question. Does a camera light count as a directional antenna? Maybe these are strange terms, but in the end, uh, yes, <laughs> I would say a camera is really a directed receiver. <laughs> Never thought of this uh, in these terms, uh, but in the end, from a <laughs> well, perspective of electromagnetic wave, uh, it's absolutely right. Yes, I mean, uh, you direct it. So the sun would be a kind of a omnidirectional antenna for high frequencies. That's the sun. It's not isotropic. Uh, well, it's not a point in space. It has quite a big uh, diameter, uh, but that, that's the idea. Uh, and so directional antennas in the lower frequencies. So here, usually we talk about this, let's say 400 megahertz up to five gigahertz. That's usually what you use in your smartphone, something like this. Um, you could also use directional antennas, um, but there are pros and cons. So by, def by basically construction, by construction, all the antennas you have in your smartphones are directional antennas because somewhere they have the so-called feed because you have to bring power into the antenna. Um, and as you saw with the simple examples, slide 11, for example, you see all the real antennas, they have these directive effects. So they, they have a main lobe in some direction. So you don't have this isotropic radiator in real life. And uh, so you could, for example, have the antennas installed in a way that you assume you hold your smartphone to your ear and then you have kind of one of the lobes directed uh, either away from your head towards the air or through your head towards an antenna and then your head well the water in your head focuses the electromagnetic waves uh, to the mobile phone and you do not have that much radiation uh, you know along the body of the device but Today, you carry the uh, smartphones in all arbitrary positions, even put them on metallic surfaces, etc. So the antennas are uh, that good that you can always more or less receive something. The signals are strong enough and you have several antennas. So today, smartphones, they uh, use the MIMO technology. You have four antennas, for example, and then you can receive wireless LAN with uh, much higher data rates. That's the .11ac standard. We will come back to the standards uh, later. So hmm, real full directional antennas, that's a problem because that depends really on how you hold the smartphone. That's a problem. But as I said, they're all directional and hopefully the signal is always strong enough. It's different when we talk about the antennas we have at the base stations. If you have a closer look at these antennas, just go out on the street, you might notice that some of the antennas, they are tilted. They are tilted downwards towards the street. So the main lobe uh, they create is tilted down to the street. That's exactly uh, the idea because uh, you do not want to cover the sky, for example. But still, the networks do work also, let's say, in the sky. Uh, if you use, for example, or if you check for the signals in an aircraft, if it's flying at the not too high altitude, you will already receive LTE networks. Yes, so the antennas are quite good. And uh, so it is possible to receive LTE also in the air. So if it's flying or it's just uh, at some minutes before landing, before touchdown, then it, it w works already. Maybe not that good at 10,000 meters, but at 3,000, 2,000 meters, it works. The networks are not made for this, but they work. The in-cabin networks, they usually operate via either satellite, that's uh, over open water, or they have special ground stations different frequencies, different technologies. So that's, that's the idea. And how to improve the gain of the antenna? There are uh, 
different technologies. One is by design. So the way you design the shape of the antenna actually determines uh, where the main lobe goes. So that's the basic idea uh, how you can uh, improve the antenna gain. And then there are many ways of amplification. So electronic ways, simpler, so-called low noise amplifier. They try to amplify whatever there is. Okay, that much, I guess, to these really uh, lower layer things. Any more questions there? Because then we will go to slide 21. So in this rather shorter section, I covered a bit about signal propagation. That's something we do not talk much about in computer networks because there we say, okay, we have fiber optics, we have uh, copper wires and they have also their sometimes strange characteristics, but in the end, if you just pump some light into a fiber optics, it will come out on the other side. So um, not that much happens there. Uh, the bit error rates are very low, 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the minus 12, something like this. So only one out of billion whatever bit is flipped. Here in the wireless domain, it's completely different. You have many, many, many problems and you should be at least aware of the problems. So uh, here we don't have a wave guide like fiber optics. Fiber optics guides the light or a copper wire guides actually the electromagnetic waves and the electric current. Um, but here we don't have a wave guide. Not really. So signals, they simply propagate through space. And this is why we have these signal propagation ranges, these transmission ranges, interference. So don't get me wrong. We also have interference with copper wires, for example. So also DSL cables, uh, they interfere each other. Not that much for fiber optics, but here it's extreme. And even without the interference with other signals, we have all these problems when the signals travel through space. So you should be at least aware of the problems. You don't have to calculate anything there. That's electrical engineering. And you saw uh, the real world examples on slide 18 uh, that it really looks sometimes strange when you follow all the different waves. By the way, you can do generate so pictures using ray tracing, something from computer graphics. But um, so you should be able to answer questions like, why do the radio waves not always follow a straight line? Why do we sometimes even like this? Can you come up with the idea why we like reflection? So why it's useful? Harmful? Well, okay. That's something we can imagine. Why can reflection be useful? Yes, we can go farther. Yes, especially you can get the signal even without the line of sight. That's exactly, that's exactly the point. Because just go out on the street and check if you can see, directly see a base station. Usually, no. And this gives you a quite good comparison between high frequencies. That's exactly the term. I see the base station because our eyes operate at several hundred terahertz. That's visible light, other name. Sometimes it's strange if I talk about high frequencies, but that's the same. So high frequencies, only light of sight. Unless the big skyscraper has kind of a mirroring outside and then we see the reflected base station, <laughs> then it also works for this. But usually we don't see it, but the waves with the lower frequencies we use for our smartphones, for example, or wireless LANs, they are also reflected at other surfaces. 
or there's diffraction, etc. All the other effects. So exactly, we do not always have a line of sight. Line of sight is rather, well, seldom I'd say. Uh, that's the ideal case. So line of sight is nice, but usually we need reflection. But then reflection um, also have a big, big problem. Why could, uh, could you think of, okay, reflection, what is, and this is exactly also uh, the next question. Um, we have some, some problems here in addition when we have these reflections. Yes, exactly. Reflections, they create multipath receptions because maybe, maybe you have the direct line of sight. Line of sight has always the shortest delay. But then you have also the reflected signals. And then we are exactly at the multipath propagation scheme. And there we have the problem that we do not have a simple scenario as I showed it on slide 19, but we do have maybe millions or an uncountable number of different paths. So we do not only have three or 10 or something like this. So we always smear the signal a bit in time because, and that's the main problem, and you should have understood that, uh, that the different paths travel different distances. And for to cover, let's say 30 centimeters, you need at least one nanosecond. That's something you can rather think of. Okay, 30 centimeters equals one nanosecond for the electromagnetic wave. In real space, the waves need a bit longer because as soon as electromagnetic waves travel through something, some matter, whatever it is, air, trees, our bodies, a wall, whatever, they slow down a bit. They cannot go faster than light, but the speed of light is only valid in vacuum. So, but okay, for now it's okay to think of 30 centimeters, one nanosecond. So that means if your, uh, your reflection causes additional delay of, well, three meters, then we are already at 10 nanoseconds, 30 meters, we're already at 100 nanoseconds, 300 meters, we are already at a microsecond. And then if you think of high data rates, higher frequencies, that could already mean you have a shift in your phase that uh, basically, as shown then also in the slide, smears into the next symbol. A symbol, we will learn what this means when we come to modulation. A symbol can represent several bits, one or several bits, for example. And then you smear your signal into this next symbol. And then we have a problem. In addition, you have a lot of attenuation. And the attenuation is different for the different ways. So maybe the reflected signal is even stronger than the line of sight signal. This could happen if the line of sight signal goes through a tree, especially a wet tree after rainfall. Then the water absorbs a lot of the energy. And then this first part of the signal traveling the line of sight arrives at the first at the receiver, but is weaker compared to the reflected signal that well has a longer path but is reflected at a building. And uh, this makes the, well, recalculation of the original signal a bit more complicated. So usually receivers, they use different so-called fingers. Fingers, uh, that means you, you have your antenna and then you feed the signal into different delay components and they delay the signal depending on the different delays the signal experiences while traveling from sender to receiver. And then you can reconstruct the original signal. A big question is, where you, do you get the delays from? <laughs> but 
because the delays they vary over time you can imagine you walk or you drive through a city and then permanently those multi paths change so what is done i will explain this also a bit more when we come to cellular technologies is that you have certain well-known signals so-called pilots so you send a well-known signal and the receiver knows how this well-known signal should look like and depending on the in reality received well-known signal the receiver can then say what happens to the signals when they travel from the sender to the receiver and then with the help of this so-called pilot signal you can fine-tune the different receivers the delays in the receivers but you have to do this hundreds of times per second so that's quite a lot to do uh, you can imagine this consumes also energy in your mobile phone when you have adapt all the time so depending on the technology this can be quite some stress <laughs> okay so many other influences i have you have some examples there of what can happen to the signals and uh, so, so so what else could influence multipath we covered a bit we can benefit by reconstruction and especially you should uh, should be quite clear for you what this isi means intersimple interference and especially what happens with your uh, simple rate you can achieve what happens if we go for higher data rates that means higher simple rate can you think what what happens then when you think of this inter simple interference Okay, while you're thinking, I can answer the other question. Okay, first uh, the ISI, then I will come back to this question about the degradation and pilot signals. So the problem is, the higher your data rate is, for example, as we will see when you come to modulation, you put four bits in a symbol or two bits in a symbol. The higher your data rate is, the more symbols per second you have to transmit. Or if, you, if you're talking about bits, we, we transmit more bits per second. But the closer the symbols are to each other. And now if you look at this slide number 19, if we uh, think of the symbols we transmit, uh, then you have more and more well symbols you send uh, on the sender side so and those symbols they will get closer and closer and closer to each other so if we send more symbols for example we have to oops uh, squeeze something in between and another symbol here Whatever simple means, I will come back to this in the next lecture. But you send more and more symbols per second. So the gaps between the symbols here, this gap is even smaller, smaller, smaller. So whatever gap means here, but you have to be able to distinguish between different symbols. And the more you send per second, the more you run into this overlapping and this overlapping is then exactly this intersimple interference. Intersimple interference means interference between different symbols. So they overlap. And here in this example, you have the overlapping exactly here. Here, the green signal overlaps with a black signal. And that's our problem. That's our problem because the, uh, then for example, if uh, one part of the sine wave goes up from the green signal and from the black uh, signal it goes down, they cancel out each other and you will not receive anything. So 
that is our problem if we go to higher data rates. Okay, so in the simple interference, that's a problem. And especially if you move, for example, in a car faster and faster, uh, the problem here gets worse and worse. So, and also something you will understand at the end of the chapter, I will come back to this. We will have schemes for multiplexing users in the next lecture. And uh, if you have intersimple interference, you cannot have these nice time slots for different participants because then your time slot or this, your signals will smear into the next time slot. I will come back to this. So you see sometimes the questions, they are already a bit pointers to uh, next parts of the lecture. But then there was a question, what happens if some whatever another antenna impersonates the pilot signal? Can this series degrade the connection? Yes. <laughs> so uh, if you, but, well, this requires a certain precise synchronization. So you have to know where the pilot signals are. But uh, if you fake pilot signals, <laughs> yes, <laughs> then uh, I, I, I bet the connection breaks down. So, I mean, you can already fake a whole base station, uh, but that's something different. Uh, but if you start playing with this, then this is some kind of a smart uh, jamming, I would say. Jamming is just, well, put some noise on the channel. But to play with the pilot signal, uh, that's a nice idea. Yeah, so you can simulate a strong and very close pilot, so a strong signal, and so uh, the receiver thinks everything is fine, and then fine-tunes the receiver in a complete wrong way. Yes, <laughs> that's absolutely true. That's, uh, that's true, yeah. Okay, so um, we have... Uh, then also one effect you should be aware of and there the term is fading 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 that means the strength of the signal varies over time this can be in a quite fast way then you have fast or short-term fading or it can be in a slow way slow or longer term fading so as you see from the slides, um, if you move closer to a base station, the signal gets stronger. If you move further away, the signal gets weaker. So that definitely is some slow fading because it's longer term. Could you imagine what can you do against this kind of slow fading? What could a receiver or a sender do? What can you do there? If you experience as a receiver, for example, that the signal gets weaker and weaker. Hmm. What do you do if, uh -huh, right? Someone has to amplify, but who has to amplify the signal? And you're right, this depends on the signal to noise ratio. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you cannot amplify. So you as a receiver, same true here for the Q&A session. If you cannot hear my voice, you have to signal to me, please send with a stronger signal. So that means the receiver for slow fading, you could tell the sender, please increase your signal power. That's something all the mobile phones, all the devices do. They tell all the time, sometimes 100 times per second or more often, uh, you basically tell the sender stronger, stronger, weaker, 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 stronger, stronger, weaker, weaker, weaker. That's something you can do if uh, the signal is too weak or too strong. If there's too much interference, the receivers can measure the signal strength compared to the overall noise. If there's too much noise, you can change maybe Go to another frequency. 
So these are things you can do here on the physical layer, switching frequencies. We will learn later on on higher layers you can do something, please repeat the data, but here on the physical layer uh, we can check to another frequency. This, by the way, is exactly what we do by this so-called dynamic frequency selection. Uh, that's what the wireless LAN routers have to do at 5 gigahertz. So you have to be able to go through different frequencies if we have a problem, for example, with a flight radar. Okay, that's uh, one thing uh, you can do. Then what uh, happens if you have this fast fading? Fast fading, uh, that means you have extreme changes in the signal strength within microseconds or even less. So uh, with classical analog radio in a car, maybe you notice with older radios that the reception is quite good at a traffic light and then you just move your car just some centimeters and suddenly oh, bad reception. Then again, good reception. So, and if you drive with your car, the same happens to your mobile phone, etc. You have good, bad, good, bad, good, bad uh, reception. And this can change quite often. So there you cannot adapt the transmission power. You're simply not fast enough, but we will learn when we come to modulation technologies that you can adapt the so-called modulation scheme. So fast fading, just um, to give you a hint where this happened and where you maybe saw this already at high school, we saw these nice patterns. So just to give an example, uh, I bet on high school you had the example, this should be a nice straight laser like, and then you had this experiment with this, maybe just a tiny little hole in a metal plate or a slit, slit or hole. And then you had this nice effect that this creates this wave patterns, wave patterns of minima and maxima. And you can do exactly the same with water waves. So electromagnetic waves or water waves, the same happens. Now you can also imagine, to make it a bit more interesting, oh, we also have a second laser. <laughs> so, uh, so basically we split the slide. This can also have this nice, nice patterns <laughs> and so on and so on. Um, and that's ex something similar to what we do with our multipath propagation. So you have this, this is the high school physics experiment. So also for our multipath propagation, we generate these patterns of minima and maxima. And now imagine you walk with you. Now we are back at our smartphone, electromagnetic waves. So don't think of the laser here, but with other antennas and think of this is reflection and you walk through this field. This is exactly what you do with your smartphone when you walk through, for example, downtown, there you have many of these multipath effects. And then you always have minimum, maximum, mini maximum, and maybe only some centimeters between minima uh, and uh, maxima. And this is something you cannot uh, adjust for using the signal that the power control, so you cannot simply adjust the power that fast. So uh, then if you have effects like this, uh, you have to do something like, oh, we dropped some data on layer two. We will learn that we use quite often for uh, forward error correction, FEC. Um, so we can reconstruct the original data already, uh, uh, although we missed some of the bits. Or we can use uh, something, you don't have to know this, we can use some adaptive modulation schemes. So, or hierarchical modulation schemes. I will talk about this in the next lecture. So we can fight against this, we can adapt the sending power 
but at least uh, we can do something. So fast fading is something that happens really in the, the microsecond range. So it's extremely fast, these fading effects. Okay, so that was a lot of explanation, but you see roughly 90 minutes of lecture results in almost 90 minutes of questions and tasks and talking about the material. Any more questions from your side? So if you um, do have any more questions, no problem. You can also email them. Then we'll come up with these questions in the next Q&A session. So that is no problem. So if there are some more questions that pop up while watching the videos, and uh, then for the next time, uh, please do have a look into the next sections, which is basically multiplexing, modulation, demodulation, and uh, spreading, spreading, despreading of signals. So I know this is a bit more, let's say, electrical engineering. But as computer scientists, you should have a basic understanding of this. The reason is quite simple. If you later on program something for mobile devices, you have to be aware of the effects because they heavily influence all the protocols on the higher layers. Some of the protocols simply break down. They do not expect a loss in connection because usually your cable does not break or you do not unplug your device. But for wireless system, this is quite normal, absolutely normal. Error rates 10 to the minus two, quite normal. So you will never have perfect signals. You will always have the effects. So for wireless system, it's normal to have these problems, to have errors. For wired systems, not. And if we later on then have a look into the higher layer protocols like TCP, for example, they behave, well, not in a very nice way if we directly use them on top of these wireless and mobile systems. And this is the reason why you should have at least a basic understanding of these uh, problems we have down here. And then the next time, as I said, I will cover some more of these aspects. And two weeks from now, then we go briefly through cellular systems and then we dig into medium access because then this is also different from wired systems. So, and there was a question, um, why don't the signals for two different devices interfere? Oh, they do. <laughs> so if you do not have a special medium access control, chapter three, and you operate two devices on the same frequency and you do not apply any other multiplexing technology, there will be interference. And the point is, as we will learn in mainly two weeks from now, we have to separate. One week from now, we see some multiplexing schemes and two weeks from now, then some access schemes. We have to separate the different devices. If we do not separate them, we will have interference. And this is exactly what lets your wireless LAN break down. If you have many other wireless LANs in your neighborhood, a lot of interference. So that is a problem. On this lower layer, that was the second question. How can we establish and maintain private connections? On these lower layers, the physical, those signals, they will always interfere. So there are no private signals or public signals. Signals are always public. So everyone can receive the signals, signals will always interfere. So how to have a private connection? There are some tricks. As we will learn later on in, late, in chapters, uh, chapters uh, we will code our signals. So we will apply special codes and then the signals may interfere. You will be also able to receive the signals, but those signals appear as noise, as 